you doing well? I think I'm on. I am on. Good. I just want to share a few of the announcements that we have. Um, uh, the flowers on the altar are in memory of Larry McDowell. If you see Pat, tell her that you're thinking of her in her time of loss as she uh, remembers her husband. Uh, also, virtual coffee hour is 1015 to 1045. We will be doing that today. So if you're online and you're missing the fellowship, we invite you to do that. If you haven't got a COVID vaccine, um, there are a couple of options. And not only can you go on the website and it's uh, according to the health department, you can uh, sign up. That's according to how you signed up or when you signed up. Or I did see a couple open spots at CVS. There's also a couple of places through uh, the preschool with Brenda Chapman or in the city, Gretchen Guckenauer. Just to let you know, there's a couple of places you can get your COVID shot. Uh, Bible study, we have three that we offer. We have a woman's at 6 p.m. that's in the house upstairs in the um, library. We have a men's, which is at 6.15. It's hybrid. It's here in one of the rooms. I think that is the basic room, and they're also doing it online. Also, Seedbed Daily is at 7 p.m. Uh, silent auction will be... Uh, for the cemetery plot ends on the 30th. Are you somebody who is looking to take care of your funeral arrangements? It's a great deal. It's probably about a third of the cost that it would cost you if you'd gone over there. But because of a donation from somebody in the congregation, we have been given these and we are trying to raise funds to take care of the building. Uh, we want to give a praise the Lord. We have... Uh, finished and completed our counting team. We now have four, which is a good thing. That means they only have to do that once a month. We also want to thank you for your giving as you continue to give online, in person, and uh, through the mail. We have been blessed. We've been able to keep open. We've been able to keep functioning, and we just want to thank you for your generous donations. Also, you'll notice up here we have some of these little handouts. This is to invite your friends, families, and neighbors to our uh, worship services. We have three on Easter, 6.30 a.m. down at Messick Point, 8.45 here, and the sticks are going to be doing uh, something special for that. And then at 11 o'clock, we've got some special music. Uh, we are going to get to basically sing behind our mask, which we're pretty excited, but we're going to have live music at 11 o'clock, and we're looking forward to that. No pre-recorded stuff. Uh, also, we have some yard signs. If you are somebody that lives in a location that everybody can see, we invite you to please take one of these and put it up in your yard. Uh, it's very helpful because a lot of people are getting to see those, and they'll know that they can come and worship with us on that Sunday. Uh, I also I want to let you know about Easter week. We have Palm Sunday next Sunday, believe it or not. I can't believe it's already here. Uh, it's going to be bells. We've got bells ringing, and that's going to be exciting because we haven't had them for over a year, and we're excited. Am I right? Am I wrong? Okay, I'm right. And the bells are going to be here, and they're going to be ringing, and we're excited about that. If in person, they're going to be ringing at both services. We also have on Monday, Thursday, April 1st, we have a service at 7 p.m., I still need a couple of readers. I think I need four more readers to help be a part of that service. We will be having communion on that service, and I just want to thank you in advance for serving. Uh, that's an awesome thing. So we invite you to come on out on April 1st at 7 p.m. I've already told you about the Easter services, and so just make sure that you're prepared and you're ready to come and be a part of that. As we begin, as everybody begins to gather, we're going to take some time to center ourselves and to focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us please pray. Father God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for calling us, for being our light, for being the King of King and the Lord of Lords, for being the one who calls us to be ever faithful. We thank you for all that have gathered here today and those who are online. I ask a special blessing for those who choose to be a part of your world, who choose to allow you to come and be their God, for those who choose to walk in the light as you are in the light, and who choose to walk in faithfulness. Be with us today as we celebrate that faithfulness. And 
and as we look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And all the people say, amen. Amen and amen. It is time for us now to sing our opening praise. Light of the world, here I am to worship. Would you please stand? You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come on down. Before you go too far, I heard that there was a couple of these little kids and a couple of people in congregation who had birthdays. Birthday. Birthday in March. If it was your birthday in March, would you please stand? Stand up. Whew. The only one in the... Oh, there we go. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God loves you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. All right. Good morning, guys. That wasn't very convincing. Good morning, guys. All right. How y'all doing this morning? All right. So y'all like exploration, right? Y'all like exploring things? So let's do a hypothetical real quick. We are exploring a dark cave. What's the first thing you bring with you? A flashlight. As represented by this candle because I'm Amish. I'm just kidding. I couldn't find an, an actual flashlight. Oh, wait. We got a flashlight. Let's go. All right. We got an actual flashlight. So... You can't explore the cave without a flashlight because otherwise you'd be stumbling around in darkness. You'd probably uh, stumble and fall 
and you probably hurt yourself. You might see a bear as well. You never know what you find inside of a cave. You might, you might hit your head. But, but the point is, you can't explore any dark place without light. If you don't have a light, you'll probably get hurt. But, but did you know that sometimes our walk with God takes us into some dark places? And if we don't have the light of God with us, we're going to stumble and fall in those places. And that actually ties in with our Bible message this morning, which comes from, first, which comes from 1 John chapter 1. You know what that says? It says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. But if we say we walk with God, but still walk in darkness, we're lying. Now, what does that mean, to walk in darkness? What do you think it means? You just shouted that. We're in a dark place. Okay. That's, that's good. That's a good answer. So what's one thing that we do that separates us from God? Starts with Ness. Sin. If we say we walk with God, but we continue on our old sinful ways, we're not walking with God. We're lying. And we don't have that light of God with us. But when we do turn away from our sinful ways, and start walking towards God, and start walking with God, we do have that light of God with us. And we can navigate those dark places so that we don't stumble and fall. You know what else we can do with that light? We can shine it in other dark places where the light of God isn't. And bring the light of God there as well. So what about you and your lives? You stumbling around in darkness? Do you have any sins that you need to get rid of? Are you actually walking in the light of God? What can I do this week to bring me closer to the light of God? It's something to think about this week. Do you think you remember that? All right, let's pray. Y'all can repeat after me. Dear Lord. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for giving us your light. We pray this week that we might find ways to spread that light to others. Love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Y'all can go with Miss Laura now. Give love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give light, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart. So 
When I think of breath, I think of the Ruach, the wind, breath, spirit of God. In the scriptures, it talks about how God's breath comes and infills us and brings us to life. And so whenever I hear that song, that's where my mind automatically goes, about the breath of God coming into us and giving us life. Today, we're going to be talking about life. We're going to be talking, this is our last our last uh, sermon in the series, Discipleship, and we're going to be talking about light walking or walking in the light of Christ. I'm going to start with uh, the scripture from 1 John 1, 5 through 10. I invite you to read along out loud with your breath. Let us read the word of the Lord together. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father God, I ask that the presence of your Holy Spirit would come and fill us today, that we might hear your message for each one of us, that you might bring us to a place that is closer to your light and your love, and that we might walk more intently in the ruach, the wind, breath, spirit of you. It is in Jesus' holy name we pray, and we all say amen and amen. It was back in 1969 that In past Christian Mississippi, a group of people were preparing for the Hurricane Camille. They decided what they would do would be having a hurricane party. Have you ever heard of anybody doing that? They all got together in an apartment building, and they began to mix their drinks and have a cordial time. As they did that, a policeman, Chief Jerry Perelita, Perelita, came and shared with them that the storm was hitting right to where they were. They were in Richelieu apartments, and they all looked at him like he was crazy. He says, no, you really need to leave. You're in the evacuation zone. And somebody said, well, this is my land, and I'm going to stay here. You have to arrest me. Well, he didn't have the right to arrest them, so he let them stay there. But he did do something very smart. Before he left, he took the names of each one of them and their next to ten. It was about 10, 15 p.m. when the front wall of the storm hit. And when it did, the mile, 205 miles per hour, the strongest on record, the rain was like bullets hitting against the skin and the walls and the windows. The, wa- the waves of the coast crested 22 to 28 feet. By the end of the storm, past Christian Mississippi was no more. It had wiped out all of the bars, all of the gambling houses, all of the hotels, everything that was in that area. Nothing was even left of that three-story building except for the foundation. 
The only survivor was a five-year-old little boy found clinging to a mattress for his life. Sadly, people do not listen to warning signs. Sadly, people find themselves thinking they are entitled to live and do as they please. Consciously, they do not make the decisions that they should, and it leads to irrevocable damages, not only in their life, but in the lives of others. John understood that, and that's why he passionately speaks to the people in his day and our day about walking in the light as God is in the light. He provides the solid understanding of a foundation with God. And yet in the midst of this undeniable fact, people still walk away from God. People still choose to walk in darkness instead of light. And John's epistle is a message of warning for us today. He hopes that we won't be swept away by the cultural storms of our day. He hopes that instead we'll choose to live and walk in the light of Christ, and stand on the foundation of his word. John begins today by telling us that this is the message we have heard from God and declare to you. Remember, John is an apostle. He understands this. He said, God is light, and in them there is no darkness at all. Well, when you think of light, what do you think of? You think of something showing you the way. John saw the light of God as the great revelation to his people. He saw them as someone who shone a light in the places that had the flaws and stains. It is in the light that we can see. I don't know how many times when I have a stain on something, I turn the light on so I can pre-spray it, right? (laughs) So as we put it in the light, we begin to see. Another thing we see, though, is that the light also reveals our wrinkles and our sin. And it's in this place that we realize that people like to flee from the light and they like to live in darkness. It's only when we're in relationship with him and we are in that place where we live in his love that we can know the true light. The psalmist says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Light then is the presence of God in a relationship with us. It is the understanding of how our life is as a Christian in our human existence in the presence of Christ. Now, in contrast, we see darkness. Darkness in the scriptures, Old and New Testament, is a correlation for anything that is not God. It is a correlation for anything that excludes fellowship from God. When we turn from the light and live in darkness, our deeds are evil. If you think about it, a person's character will determine the character of their God. So we know that their God is a God of darkness. Who is your God? Are you living in the light? Throughout the Old and New Testament, this darkness is a graphic word that is is anything that is wicked, judgment, death. It is spiritual death. It is an unregenerated spirit, something that is chosen to live spiritually dead and what we call original sin. Now, original sin is how we're born. We're born into sin. We're not born because of sin. We're born into sin because of Adam. Only people who are spiritually alive can understand God's word, and only they are those who can live in the spiritual light. The unregenerative, it is impossible for them to understand God's word. They are enemies of God, and God is not within them. The Spirit cannot abide there. Now, according to the Scriptures and the Daily News, Lord have mercy, our universe is currently dominated by spiritual darkness. Can I have an amen? You see it on the news, you read it in the Scriptures, so you know. We know that's because Satan and the fallen angels came, and they are called, are allowed to, I shouldn't say called, they're allowed to wreak havoc on earth. It is only if we are those who see the light and dwell in the light that we can see the evil among us. It is only those who walk in the light when God opens our eyes that we can turn from the darkness and Satan has no power in our lives. Light is God's nature, and he wills for it to be ours too. So the question today is, do you walk in the light as Christ is in the light? 
Do you live and walk in the ways of darkness or the ways of the world? Now, John says if we claim to have fellowship with God, yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in truth. Three times in this text, if you want to open your scriptures, in verse 6, 8, and 10, John repeats the, pra- the phrase, if we claim, if we claim. And the first one is, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in truth. If we claim, he's saying that we're claiming that we have one identity when in reality we have another. So what he's talking about is those who were called Gnostics. Say that word with me, Gnostics. Gnostics were people who believed in Jesus in a different way. Gnostics were those who believed that the way you went to heaven was through spiritual insight. They were those who were religious or philosophical movement in the first and second century that believed that the Bible was the written revelation of an inferior god, a god named Demiorgus, and it was filled with lies. They intended, they believed it intended to cloud the judgment in the minds of spiritual human beings. They believed that when they were saved, the way that they were saved was not through the word, not through confession of sins, not through Jesus Christ, but through a divine illumination that came down or a spiritual encounter that allowed them to be saved. It was all cranial. That's probably the best way to say it. They also claimed that they had a relationship with God, which was intellectual and a spiritual advancement. But their lives were living the constantly opposite of that. They were saying they knew Jesus, and yet in their their world, they were not those who were in relationship with others. From them, God's law ceased to exist. John says that these Gnostics were liars because not only did they still walk in darkness, they didn't follow the moral and ethical ways of Christ, and they also did not have relationship with fellow Christians. Those who walk in the darkness or the Christless life cannot have fellowship with God. Thus, the proof was in the pudding, is the best way to say it. They were those who did not obey God's law, and Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. They ignored the Holy Spirit and God's directions, and when we do that, we have no fellowship with God. And they were those who professed God's love but disobeyed him outly. Deeds and talk need to be right. They need to be one if we're going to do what I call light walking, walking with Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be perfect. Who in here is perfect? Thank you. No one raised your hand. We all have what? Sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If we all had to be perfect, we wouldn't be in relationship with God. But it does mean that we are obligated in our relationship with God to listen to the Holy Spirit, and to realize when we have missed the mark. The word for sin is hamarta. It means missing the mark or the target. Do you have everything perfect every day, all the time? No, none of us do. When we miss the mark, we are to realize in an obligation of relationship with God that that breaks our relationship with him, and we need to confess our sins. Now, Many Christians are not aware of their true condition. They, like the Gnostics, have this analytical or way of justifying their sins and not walking in the ways of God. They know they're saved and have the experience of conversion, but they are missing the depth of fellowship with God. The Christian who temporarily walks in the darkness is still saved, but the fellowship with God is not sweet. It is not intense. And they're walking further and further and further away from God. The problem with that is this. Eventually, they get in such darkness that the darkness overcomes them. And because of their shame, they will not turn back to God. There are many shades of gray. Do you guys remember that book, Shades of Gray? Fifty Shades of Gray? There's many shades of gray, and people like living in the shadows, or at least a little bit of a shadow. But the problem is, is because of this, many times they get caught in what I would call a false truth. They get so accustomed to the sin 
that they lose their way. It was back in 2004 that the governor of the state of New Jersey was caught in a scandal. Though he was married with children, he was also having a sexual relationship with another man. At the press conference, he admitted this by saying, my truth is that I'm a gay American. Those were very carefully chosen words. He says, my truth. You know, I have a truth and you have a truth. The problem is, Jesus says this, I am the truth. The Bible is clear about truth, greater than any individual's feeling about it. The word of God clearly says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Having a sexual relation outside of marriage is considered adultery. Beloved, what is your truth? Is your truth based on the word of God, or is it based on something else? Are you walking in the living truth of Christ, or are you following the ways of the world? It's okay to have extramarital affairs, many people think, or to have sex out of marriage. The word of God is very blunt about that. John continues, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. So instead of a mistruth, he's correcting it with a truth. In this, he says there's two great tests to living in God's truth. The first is we have fellowship with God. We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with one another. As I said before, the Gnostics struggled with their relationship with one another. They were exclusive. They hated their brothers. If they didn't believe the way that somebody else believed, they chose not to be open to their beliefs. And they chose to exclude them because they said they were dumb. They weren't enlightened. But if we have fellowship with our brethren, it is proof that our fellowship is with God. You can't have one without the other. I think Wesley said there is no such thing as solitary religion. If you're not in communion with somebody and with the world and sharing God's love, then you're not really in relationship with God. He says the second truth is in this light walking is that the blood of Jesus keeps cleansing us from every defilement of sin. The language here is Old Testament sacrifice system. But what it's talking about is that Christ died once and for all, not only for our past sins, but our present sins and our future sins. You see, his sacrifice was a sacrifice that allows us to understand that we have a relationship with God. He's the one that tore the veil. He's the one that made the way for us. And day by day, if we, as I said last week, have short accounts and we are penitent, we become more holy each day as we get closer and closer to God. We become more fit, I want to say, as the blood of Jesus washes us clean. Abraham Lincoln once said, It is the duty of every nation as well as every man and woman to continually confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow with the assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon. Well, you and I both know that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us, right, of all unrighteousness. We know that. We know that God is holy and his promise is sure. He removes the sin and the stain, making us holy and renewing our fellowship with him. Now, if we claim to have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Remember those first three words? If we claim. Once again, he is given an argument against false thinking and the Gnostics. The Gnostics were claiming that the sin principle had no power over them or even had any presence in them. What they were denying was original sin, the innate bent to sin. Well, if you've ever seen a two-year-old, you know that every two-year-old has an innate what? Bent to sin. And the big word is what? Mine or no. <laughs> and so you know that we are born with that innate bent to be selfish or self-centered. The Gnostics were claiming the sin principle had no power over them, that they weren't born a sinner, and that this power of sin's rubric had no association with anything of them. Well, what James is saying is if we believe that, if we believe that we're those who do not have an innate bent to sin, then we're deceiving ourselves. 
The Gnostics accepted no responsibility for their immoral actions. Kind of reminds me of what's been happening in our society today, right? So they were, ex they were accepting no responsibility for immoral actions. They were arguing like the dualists in Corinth who said, we have a flesh side and we have a spirit side. We are those that if it's something to do with the flesh, it doesn't matter to us because our spirit is saved. Basically what they were saying, that they were beyond the category of evil. They were beyond the category. They were over it. No longer did they have to worry about it. When the principle of sin is denied, truth as an inner principle, you can call it the still small voice, you can call it whatever you want, and the life does not exist. In God's name, we make God's presence and power and its impossibility. Gossip, defiling of persons, hatred of the brother, uh, jealousy, boasting, doing harmful acts become sanctioned as non-sins. Walking in the light is denied. You see what I'm saying? Have you seen that in our society lately? I have. It is in that that they claim to be walking in the light while practicing deeds of wickedness. And their wickedness is something that is so great that they even call it righteous. Without becoming righteous or doing righteous acts, they, like our world today, claim that it is truth when it's actually a lie. For John, the test of truth is not belief, even though it doesn't exclude that. He says, the test of truth is your actions and your deeds. Much as James said, you tell me you believe, I'll show you I believe. Do we walk in the light of Christ? Are we light walking? A man once claimed to be without sin, and he confronted Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, and intrigued, the preacher said, I'll buy that. Come on to dinner with me, and let's have some time together. And as the man explained it, Spurgeon just arose from his chair at the end of dinner. He picked up his glass of water, and he threw it at the man's face. The man then did major explicitives and began to show his imperfection, causing quite a scene to allow his anger and language of beyond what he would say curiosity or courtesy. To which Spurgeon, with a twinkle in his eye, just said, ah, I see I have awakened the old man you claim is dead. <laughs> he has simply been fainted, and I revived him with a simple glass of water. We can tell our true Christianity and what we believe about ourselves when something is pressed upon us, can we not? When a trial comes, when we hit our thumb with a hanger, ha hanger hammer, what happens to our mouth, Right? There you go. But, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. This is the second definitive test that we're walking in the light. Then he will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That definitive test says that by confessing, instead of denying, we come into the full relationship with God. You see, when we confess, our actions connect us with God's mercy. When we are humble, we get what they call a catharozo, a catharization, and it opens up. If you think about that, it opens up the vessel or the connection of God's love. That's the word that they actually use there. It's a picture of cleansing or an opening up from the pollution of sin so that our life can be made holy again. It is an understanding that our moral imperfections have been washed clean and the injustices that separate us from God have been removed. John says that we can depend on God and his righteousness. For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Humble confession is always the way back to God. If we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. If we claim, remember once again, we're talking about the Gnostics. What were they claiming? They were claiming they had not sinned. Not only did they have no sin, but they had not sinned, past, present, or future. We make God out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. 
This third false teaching and claim of the Gnostics was that they had progressed beyond the ability to sin. That they were those who were not only not born with the innate bent to sin, but that sin had no foothold on them at all. The Gnostics claimed they had entered into a sinless state through their knowledge. This belief was far more blatant and makes mockery of the gospel because what it's saying is that Jesus didn't need to die for our sins. Consequently, the possibility of hearing a redemptive word is denied also. The ability to live by God's word is removed because we have blocked ourselves. The possibility of receiving forgiveness offered by God is lost. We all know what Romans says. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Once there was a woman who came to Charles Wesley, the great hymn writer, and she said, would you please pray for me because I am a great sinner? He turned and said rather sternly, Yes, ma'am, I will pray for you, for truly I know you are a great sinner. Well, she was appalled when he came back with that response. She said, Well, what do you mean I'm a great sinner? I, I haven't sinned, I, I, mean, I mean, not very wrongly. So, you know, in our mind, we categorize sins, do we not? We say, Oh, well, someone who has killed somebody is a sinner. But I've never killed anybody, so I'm not a sinner. What this particular verse, verse 10, is saying is dealing with that type of person, one who justifies their sin. They say, I have sinned, but I haven't sinned that wrongly. I'm a sinner, and I have never really sinned, and that's the gist of the false claim. While we might laugh at Wesley's story because he called her on her stuff, we need to realize that if we deny that we're a sinner or that we have sinned, that we have not done anything wrong, we have not eaten from the forbidden tree, we have not done anything that would shame or hurt our brother or sister, then we have come to a place where we are denying God's word. Why? Because to say that we have never sinned is to call God a liar because God says this, Surely there is not one righteous on earth, one who does good and never sins. That's God's word. So who is right and who is lying? Is it God or is it us? Well, I think there's only one answer to that, and I think you know it. God says this, let God be true and every man a liar, because we do sin and fall short of the glory of God. However, we also know God's grace. It was in the 18th century, an abbot was disciplining two monks from an infraction of the rules. He imposed them to the rule of silence. They were going nuts, so one of the monks decided he would get 28 flat stones from the courtyard. He put different numbers on them and devised a new game. As they were giving each other signals, they figured out the rules, but the most difficult part was when one of them won, they could not speak. But they remembered that they could say, Dixie Dominus Domino Meo. By using the one word, Domio, mean Lord, meant that they won. They continued to play the game, and the abbot thought that they were praying. But in actuality, they were just playing. You see, John knows that many of us play at our Christianity. Many of us choose not to walk in life but play with spiritual dominoes and choose not to walk in the light as he is in the light. He wants us to experience a genuine fellowship with Jesus Christ. Beloved, it is our choice. Will we walk in the light as he is in the light and have sweet fellowship with God and one another? Or will we choose the ways of the world? Let us pray. Lord, this morning we have looked into your light. And we admit it reveals some stains and places in our lives that need your cleansing. But we also are grateful that you have sent your only son. And because of the revelation of who he is, you have shown us a new way. We confess our sins to you and ask that you help us. 
You help us to walk in Christ and Christ alone and that we can find our true salvation and breath, ruach, in him. It is in the holy name of Jesus we pray and all the people say, amen, amen. I do have a few uh, prayer requests for you this morning. Harvey Brown is still awaiting tests. Joyce Holloway was moved to the nursing home. Donnie Lawson is in Riverside. He had a brain bleed, and just like Joyce, and uh, I think he's in a normal room now. Is that correct, Nancy? But he is still there, and you need to be praying for him. I'm going to go to the Lord, and let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's share the time of prayer together, and then we'll end in the Lord's Prayer. If you are online and you are somebody who needs prayer, please type in and we'll make sure we give that to the prayer group and we'll pray for you this week. Let us go to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your bounty and your mercy. We thank you that we can keep short accounts. And if there is anything blocking us from a relationship that is intensely beautiful with you, please forgive us of our sins and bring us into the right relationship with you. Father, as those who are allowed to come into your presence, we come with a clean and contrite heart. And we ask that you would use us as intercessors of your grace. We pray for Donnie and Sandra. We pray for the Lawson family. We ask that you continue to be with the Brown family as they await tests. We ask, Lord, that you would be present with those who are struggling with COVID and are on the front lines. Father, we pray for our community and the many losses that we have experienced over the last month. Be with those whose hearts are hurting. We pray for Joyce as she is improving. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over her and be with Teresa and the rest of the family as they minister to her. Continue to strengthen her legs and give her what she needs. Father, we take this time of silence, and I just ask that you would hear the prayers of the people that are gathered here today. I don't know what is on their heart, but I know you know. Hear this, the prayers of your people. Here we go. Father, we pray for those who are awaiting test results, those who are in the process of getting radiation and chemotherapy. I give you a praise offering that my son and future daughter-in-law made it back safe to Virginia Beach, all the way from California. I thank you for the way that you put your hand upon us and you blow into us the breath that gives us life. And we pray all these things through the holy name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. And all the people say, Amen. Our closing song is all about light. I saw the light. Would you please stand and let us sing our praise to God?
Beloved, I pray that you have seen the light today. I pray that God has shown you his way. I pray that you realize that he has died for you and he has shown the light of his love in your path. Follow that light. Because if you do, you know one day we'll get to see each other again in glory. Go forth today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all the people say, Amen. Thank you.